is come to Guyana. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 It's a difficult thing to preach on the day before the elections as one. It's also a difficult thing to preach after 12 o'clock because the heat of the day saps the energy of the preacher. Mind you, I didn't say the saps the energy of the listener. <laughs> but really, I'm concerned about you too. One of the things that we've been talking about as an eldership is how do we cool down the church? And so we are going to come to you as we set a business meeting. We're going to come to you uh, with some ideas, with some proposals. If anybody has anything, we've been exploring different things. We've gotten different ideas and opinions. If you have any suggestions, we want to know how to cool down, how to make it here cooler. Amen? Amen? So please give that information to Brother Philip or to uh, Pastor Harold Garrett. He's our uh, person who has been looking at some of those things. So please... Um, <laughs> Did you hear Sister Bernice? She's praying for what? If we talk about revival, she said we're praying for fire. Maybe it's the heat she's talking about. Amen. All right, Sister B, I like that. A sister, a mother in the faith, 93 years old, well, 90 something. You know, ladies don't like to tell their exact age. Sister Savitri Mutu called me this week. She's one of my spiritual mothers. Known her for the last almost 40 years. As a youngster, she came back um, from Malaysia. She's a Malaysian, met her husband, a committed Christian man, a great medical doctor, and they made her home in Guyana. Two of their three children became doctors, medical doctors. And um, but the family I was always very close to. Whenever they left, before I got married, I was a um, kind of a housekeeper. People went away and left, asked me to keep their, 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 their homes for them. Keep. And um, I would say, sometimes they would call me and say, well, Eon, Eon is my call name. It's my middle name actually too. And uh, would you come? When I get there, they'll give me a bunch of keys. So we're leaving tomorrow. So when, how, when are you, how long are you going to be gone for? Well, we'll come back. We don't know exactly when. And I would keep, I would stay with, the, with that place. And so even when um, the, the doctor passed away, the husband passed away, I, I still uh, keep close to, I've still been close to the family, so I keep in touch with the family. And Sister Mutu would call me. She used to ask me one, two questions. Our main question then was, when are we going to put back religious education in schools? I didn't have an answer, but she would always call me with that. So we would explore. We would talk about different things. And I always wondered, why is it that she's asking me that question? Every time she would call, pick up that phone, and she can't get me at home, she'd call the office. She would track me down. And when she can't get me, when she does eventually get me, eh, this is how she would say, Eon, you know I've been calling you, you're always so busy. It's easier to get through to God than to you. I said, Sister Mutu, what else do you expect? <laughs> this week she called and she said, she didn't ask me anything. She just called and she said, I want to say this to you. She said, whoever wins the next elections, God, whichever party wins the next elections, God is still on the throne. God is still in charge. And she hung up the phone. That's all she called to tell me. She said, whoever wins the next elections, whichever party wins, God is still on the throne. Brothers and sisters, that is a word from God, I believe, to me, as much as it's a prophetic word, a direct word to all of us here at South Road. So I'm conveying that. I'm assuring your heart. Preaching a message today, on this day before elections, where your minds are clouded with all kinds of things, I trust God that I can get through 
to your mind, to your heart, to your spirit for the next few moments. I know some of us want greater specificity. We want to know exactly, exactly who will win the next elections, who will form the next government. You want me to tell you? Anybody is keen to know or you already know? Anybody wants to know? Come on, talk to me, talk to me. Anybody wants to know or should I just move off and don't tell you? I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I'll tell you. Sister Mutu didn't tell me this to tell you. But I discovered that 2,600, 700 years ago, a man by the name of Isaiah spoke a word that gives us an assurance of what government is going to be like in Guyana post-March 2000, uh, March 2, 2000, 2020. Isaiah wrote a prophetic word that we only read at Christmas time. But it's a word that goes beyond the festive season. It's a word that is always good for in-season and out-of-season. It's a now word. Brothers and sisters, the topic I want to speak to you on, the focus of my message is from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. The context of that verse really tells us Isaiah speaks to a situation, to a context, where there was a lot of tension and difficulties and all of that. And the word that God sent, that God was going to bring healing. He's going to bring restoration. He was going to bring an end to conflict. He was going to cause people, the hearts of people to be joined together. Because he was going to send someone who would bear the weight of the world on his shoulders. Isaiah 9, 6, seven words I want to use from that verse. Load it. A verse that would take a long time for us to unpack. Isaiah 9, 6, 7 words as the topic for today. The government, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Seven words. Let's go. Say that with me, please. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Let's go that again. The government shall be upon his shoulder. So whichever party wins, the government, the government. Now God does not need the approval ratings of mankind to establish that fact. God does not need for us to take an opinion poll to determine the level of his authority Listen, he might, not be possible, he might not be popular among people, but certainly he's the authority. He's the person in control. And so God does not need for us to take an opinion poll. He doesn't pander to the masses. God needs for us to recognize that he is in control. So whoever wins the next elections, God wants you to know that he is still on the throne. He will not fall off the throne. He is still in control. So lift your spirit. Let the joy of the Lord flood your soul. I want to encourage you today that you can see hope for tomorrow. There's some people who can complain and cry. I don't know who's going to happen in the world. Some folks were going down Regent Street yesterday and last night and they saw how people were just buttoning up and they were just buckling down and they were just nailing plywood. They were just securing themselves because there's a sense of hopelessness in some quarters. And mind you, and mind you, while they are working to protect their investments, we may see that as a way of fear, but there are many Christians also from the way they speak. You may not be buttoning down. But for the way you just speak, from the language they use, from all the conversation they have, you know that there is an unsettling in their spirit. 
For unto us a child, would you read this please? Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. All right. Could you read that again, but a little louder? For? Could you go that one more time, a little louder? Two, three. A government, whichever party you vote for, whether they win or lose, the government is still on God's shoulders. I was sharing this morning of my sojourn in, in Jamaica, I taught there for a while. And one day I was walking across the compound from the administration block to the, to the classrooms. And this young lady, this little girl, four-year-old, Steffi came up to me and she said, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers. I said, yes, Steffi. She said, I know your wife's name. I know the name of your wife. You know my wife's name? I said, Steffi, I don't have a wife. She said, but I know. When you get married, when you get a wife, what her name will be. And I look at this child and say, here is about to come forth a prophetic word that I long to hear. I say, speak. Out of the mouth of babe and suckling, this word is going to come forth. She said, Mr. Rogers, and with all excitement, when you get married, your wife's name will be, hey, yeah, listen to this. Your wife's name will be Mrs. Rogers. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that young lady was a, a hundred percent accurate. That prophetic word was so direct, was so on target. You can't want greater specificity than that. I want to say to you, with that assurance, just like Steffi spoke to me, I want to say to you that whoever wins, God is still on the throne. His name is named the preeminent one. I'm not talking about the president one. I'm talking about the preeminent one. His name will be the Lord God Almighty. He will be. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. He will be called Mighty God. He be called everlasting father. This is not a father who would walk out on you. This is not a father who would reject you. This is not a father who would disown you. He will be called your everlasting father. And you know what? In the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all the fears, in the midst of all the chaos and confusion, in the midst of all that's happening in the world, coronavirus et al. In the midst of all of that, he will be called, he is called, the Prince of Peace. So whether the turmoil is without or the turmoil is within, we know the one who can deal with that, who can say, peace be still, because he's a Prince of Peace. Brothers and sisters, I want to say to you that sometimes we are carried away during the election season. That's why it's called a silly season. We behave silly. We don't, like, we don't think straight. This spirit of disunity, this spirit of racism, this spirit of prejudice, this spirit of hatred will come and possess many of us. And I tell you, I brought Brother Ray up to the altar this morning. Brother Bevon, I'm going to pick on you today. Would you come, please? I'm setting you up. Bavon is 100% Guyanese. He's 50% Indian and 50% black. 50 plus 50 is 100. But you know people who are mixed race? 
they have the greatest times very often being a place of acceptance. Because black people see you as Indians. And so, thank God you got to hear a little cotton shave and all of that too. Because in some communities, if you grow your hair, they really, I mean, it wouldn't take long for your hair to grow out. You can have problems in Indian communities. And black people, when you go to the next community to rescue, you can also have problems there too. Because somehow we are still have this fixation about race. When the word of God tells us that God has made us from one blood, he made all men. So that when you go to the hospital, they don't ask you what race you are. They ask you what's your blood type. Because once you have the right blood type, whatever race, it doesn't matter. Because God has made you that way. Brothers and sisters, I want you to do something. I want you to get up. I want you to hug somebody. I want you to love somebody. And even if the person is of a different race, I want you to give them even a greater blessing, a greater hug. I want you to, I want to express Jesus. I want to express love. I want to express care. This is not just about coming to church and sitting on the person next to you. I want you to go to the next step. I want you to reach out to somebody. Sister Allison, I'm going to ask you to come and help me sing a song because we move more when we sing. Yes, so would you come please? Bevan, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the setup. <laughs> Amen. Would you stand please? Oh, I love you with the love of God. Yes, I love you with the love of God. For I see in you the glory of the King. And I love you with the love of God. Yes, I love you with the love of God. Oh, I love you with the love of God. For I see in you the glory of the King. Oh, I love you with the love. I love you, Sister D. Of God. Oh, I love you with the love of God. I love you, Mel. Oh, I love you with the love of God. For I see in you the glory of the King. And I love you with the love of God. Yes, I love you with the love of God. Oh, I love you with the love of God, for I see in you the glory of the King, and I love you with the love of God. Yes, I love you with the love of God. Oh, I love you with the love of God. Bless you, love you. For I see in you the For I love you with the love of God. Yes, I love you with the love of God. Oh, I love you with the love of God. For I see in you the glory of the King, and I love you with the, the love, love of God. God. Amen. 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 God is a good God. God is a good God. God is a good God.
God is a good God. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One of the things that we recognize is that we are always in our cozy corners. We recognize that we are always in our safe places. We always come and it looks as if we can't move an inch to the left nor to the right. But once we get started, but once we get started, we don't want to stop. We can go on and on and on and on. Tomorrow we go out there with our constitutional right, our civic duty, to put that X next to uh, the candidate, the party that you think would help to advance the causes that you care much about. I want to say to you that there's no perfect party. There is no perfect political party. There's no perfect human beings. And sometimes people think that even the Christian party would deliver, would bring deliverance. The only Messiah we have is in Jesus. The only Messiah that we have is in anybody who presents himself or herself to be a Messiah. That person is not the Messiah. The Messiah is Jesus Christ. And therefore, we've got to understand that God has called us to play our part in the world. God has called us to do a number of things to bring his kingdom on the earth. The more we think about it, the more we read scripture, we're going to take some time to teach, to look at Christians and politics. Because it is still an area, law and politics are two areas that Christians, and then followed by the entertainment industry, that Christians shy away from because sometimes we don't understand what it means to be salt and light in those contexts. And so we've played in a way that expresses our reservedness. We're very reserved, we're very tentative. Should Christians get into law? And we've always heard, or we've heard for a long time, people who say that lawyers are liars. And so Christians don't, we don't encourage Christians. But, but that is changing. That is changing. Because some of the foremost minds and people of faith are people who are lawyers. As a matter of fact, you'll discover, you'll discover that law, people who get into law, very often they carry a keen sense of justice driven by their faith. They want to right the wrongs of the world. And God has made them that way. And so there are different branches of law. You check this uh, history, you see that some of the men and women who, who stood up for, against injustice, including Nelson Mandela himself, because there is that wanting to right the wrongs of the world. Of course, there are those who do not know God, those who are not Christians, and therefore, they respond a certain way. Likewise, politics. Likewise, politics. Many Christians stay away from, we've been brought up in that tradition that stay away from politics. Politics is polished tricks. That's how some people say politics is polished tricks. You know, politics come with it. It's an agenda. But when we check the scriptures, we see we don't see Christians forming a political party. But what we do see is Christians, the people of God, 
being salt and light in places of influence and involvement. And so what God is going to, the, the way of the church really, and we're going to be teaching on that a whole lot. The way of the church really is not to bring God's kingdom through politics. It's to bring God's kingdom through his word being written in our hearts and us expressing that word in our daily lives. So if it involves politics, fine. If it involves education, fine. If it involves law, fine. Whatever, wherever God takes you, just like Joseph in the house of Pharaoh, just like Daniel in the house of Nebuchadnezzar, just like the men and women of scripture and even contemporary times, as they serve, they bring to bear their Christianity. So we're going to teach more on that. But what am I challenging you about? Because sometimes we can have raised expectations of people. And we think that they will deliver. There's not been any Christian political party that has delivered anything like what they present and represent themselves to be and to do. And it's not going to happen anytime soon either. Because we're living in a fallen, broken world. So I just want to help you to understand that. We're not teaching that some more. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I'm not telling which party to vote for. I'm not going on that road. You are wise enough. I'm not even going to in any way hedge or, or hint anything. You go out there and exercise what you think is your franchise, what you know is your franchise. And let God guide you as you go. Amen? But having done that, having voted tomorrow, I want you to understand that whoever forms the next government, God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. One of the challenges that we have is that we as Christians, we pray and we fast and we condemn and we preach against when certain things politically might be going in a certain direction. When certain people are in power, we, we, oh, we cry out to God. You want to know who a Christian vote for? You don't have to ask them. Just listen to their prayers after the results of the elections. There is this triumphalism of a prayer if their party will. Lord, thank you for answering our prayers. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we, and listen, there is that rejoicing. But you see, if it's not their party will, oh, it's lamentations. We've gone to the book of Lamentations. Brothers and sisters, whoever wins, God is still on it. Our salvation is not in a politician. Our salvation is not in a political party. One of the things that, that happens is that the church is divided, too divided along racial lines and political lines. And let us not cause that to happen to us. Recently, my brother... Pastor Harold was sharing of experiences, of words, of, of church members and churches so divided that they're not talking to one another because of the political stuff. And, and he's showing me this. He's telling me that they're coming to fistic fury as well too. Man, church people, Brother Harold, you better tell that story. Church people who were there fighting against each other and get in the carnality of it all. Because one person, they perceive one person or one group or one church to be supporting of one party and the other one, they're totally against that. Listen, we are one in Christ Jesus. The politicians will love that. One political person asked us, would you endorse us as a candidate? We said, no, that's not our role. Your role is to do your political work. We pray for you. That's like we pray for anybody else who gets into politics. But the church is not called to endorse any political party. And so when you think of that, race and politics are two divisive factors in the Guyanese church. And Pastor McGovern, you should be teaching on this. Upper Winfrey. It is said that on the night 2008 when President Barack Obama won, she declared, there's never been a night like this night on the planet Earth. There's never been a night like this night, the euphoria of a black man being in the White House. The euphoria of 
lots of people around the world, and lots of Americans seeing that people of color could have sent to the highest office in the land and could be called the greatest man on the planet. That stirred a lot of people. But a lot of people became heartbroken when the policies and programs of the Obama administration went counter to their faith and belief. Brothers and sisters, you may vote for a particular political agenda. But let me tell you this. No one, no party should come above your allegiance to Christ. No person, no party should come above your allegiance to Christ. You are first and foremost a Christian. You are first and foremost a child of God. Because politicians will let you down. I've seen it in my own lifetime. Of people who have slaved themselves, who have risked their lives, who have done all kinds of stuff in the name of politics. And then when they cannot, any longer serve those political ends. They're kicked to the curb and left to die. They're ostracized. They're rejected. I'm not talking about one political party. That's the nature of politics. Every political program, every political agenda has the same issue. That you are an expendable item. You're expendable material. We will only need you for as long as you can advance our political agenda. And therefore, you've got to understand that the eternal government, that the eternal God, that the one who really is in control is the Lord God Almighty. Because he promises that he wouldn't leave us nor forsake us. You can always go to him. Lo, I am with you always. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And so you might be asking, but tell me something, Brother Desmond. How does this political agenda in a fallen, broken world equate to what you are teaching from Isaiah 9 6 and the government being on his shoulder? But let me say, brothers and sisters, God delegates his authority, his supreme authority, to human beings so that he rules and reigns through the establishment of systems in the earth. Dr. Norman Wright, a great scholar and preacher and author, he says, we place too much trust in our politicians because we place too little trust in God. We place too much trust in our politicians because we place too little trust in God. He continues, and when our politicians let us down, all we can think of is how to find another politician who will get it right this time. And so, the stability of our lives, the stability of our witness, the stability of our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm conscious that we don't have all the time in the world. But I want to share with you a few things as you go today to prepare yourselves for your voting tomorrow. I'm happy that I've recorded some things in the front of the bulletin so you can take note of those things that I said in a condensed format here. But one of the things I want to draw your attention to is Hebrews chapter 10. The Holy Spirit, reading from verse 15, also testifies to us about this. For he says, this is a covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and inscribe them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Romans 2.15 tells us pretty much the same thing. The law of God is to be written on our hearts. The law of man is not always in conformity to the law of God. But God's agenda is to place his laws in the hearts of men. God's agenda is for every man. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
So whatever is your political affiliation, whatever is your color, your political color, whatever is your political symbol, whatever is your political agenda, what God is after is for his law to be written in the hearts of men. So that his rule, so that his reign, so that his kingdom, his dominion, his domain shall be in our hearts, in our lives. So we can do the will and the purposes of God. Because the thing is, that regardless of what is your political affiliation, regardless of how many promises that you make, my dear friend, Glennis James, a number of years ago did some bumper stickers. And one of them was my particular favorite. It says, God is not a politician. He keeps all of his promises. God is not a politician. He keeps all of his promises. A gentleman many years ago told me, lies and subterfuge are the stock and trades of a politician. Lies and subterfuge are the stock and trades of a politician. And if you don't understand that, those who are getting into politics, the nature of the political game as we seek to bring change is for us to understand that the, the only way we can effect change is for the law of God to be written first of all in our hearts so that we can be living epistles known and read of all men. Daniel had that witness. Joseph had that witness that because of their relationship with God, because of their expression of their faith, as Mark was teaching us two, two Sundays ago, or was it last Sunday? Last Sunday, last Sunday. He drew our attention to Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. Daniel purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. He had a purposefulness of heart. Somebody asked me, and asked in a general context as well, what would you do if the LGBT law is passed legalizing homosexuality in Guyana? What would you do? And the same question would be asked of all the other things that have been passed in our country. Abortion. Gambling. What would you do? And I have a precedence in the Bible. I have a precedence in the Bible. Mark, you started me thinking last week as you were preaching again. Thank you very much. I see that over and over again. As you were preaching there, the word of God just... I was just resonating with what you were saying. When you pointed us to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, I think it was. Yes, Daniel chapter 6. When you spoke of Daniel, you read of, you read of Daniel. When that law was passed by, I think it was Darius. King Darius, three great kings in the in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, actually four, Belshazzar, then there was Darius, and there was Cyrus. Three great, three great kingdoms, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Chaldeans. In Daniel chapter 6, as the law was passed, verse 10, I'm going to read that so that we can connect the point that I want to make. Just that one verse, Daniel 6, 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, when he knew that the law was passed, when he knew that Darius had signed the writing into law, made it a decree, and you know what that was. And all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute 
and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. When Daniel knew that that law was passed, abolishing prayers, banning prayers of any sort to other God, to any other God, to any God other than the king, Daniel knew full well that he was in trouble. And Daniel could have excused himself by saying, I started days and this shall pass. This too shall come to pass. He could excuse himself by saying, well, I can pray in my heart. It's just communing with God. But you know what? Hear what the verse is. Daniel 16. When now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. This man could have gone into his secret closet. He could have been praying in the toilet as it were. In his private space. But he didn't do that. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. And gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. In other words, Daniel did not stop praying. No law can make right wrong. And no law can make wrong right. So what Daniel did, the conviction he had as a student, the conviction he had as a young man, he had the same conviction many decades after. Daniel prayed just as he was accustomed to. Brothers and sisters, no law was going to change his behavior. No law was going to change his conviction. He didn't have an opinion on the matter. He had a conviction. And so, what shall we do if a law is passed? God forbid. What shall we do? We will continue to pray. And we will continue to preach. We continue to declare that abortion is wrong. We continue to declare that homosexuality is wrong. That is a mandate of the church. To pray and to preach and to prophesy. That's our mandate. That's our mandate. And so, as we are called... To respond as children of God, God is calling us to recognize where our conviction lies. That's where our conviction lies. And so as you go there tomorrow, I want you to go with confidence that God is still on the throne. As we wait for the announcement of the results, you know for sure you can go about and get your work done. Yes, you'll be concerned to know who won or lost the elections. But in your heart of hearts, don't lose sleep. Go and sleep tomorrow. Even if you're surprised, you'll be surprised like, like Donald Trump. Some people went to bed being assured that the Democrats were going to win. Hillary Clinton was going to be the first female president in the United States of America. All the political pundits made a declaration, and when they woke up, many of them said, I didn't see that one coming. I want to challenge you to let us keep doing what we're doing. One of the challenges that we have is that we have brought this country to where it is as a church of God. And if we're going to move forward, it's the church of God that's got to carry it forward. We've come to a place of comfort. There was a time when the church used to go out to First Assembly of God, when we met as a body of Christ in Georgetown to pray for Guyana. And as soon as there was a change in government, the numbers dwindled. People had confidence in man. People were comfortable. Oh, these boys grew up in Sunday school. These girls grew up in Sunday school. Nah, they ain't going to do this. They ain't going to do that. But when you talk about government, they got self-government. A lot of politicians can't even govern themselves, first of all, to begin with. They can't govern their appetite. They can't govern, when I say appetite, I mean the appetite for food. 
They can't govern their, their, their appetite for sex. They can't govern their appetite for money. And therefore, they're carried in the wrong direction. Self-government is one of their problems. And you know what? It's not only politicians' problem. It's our problem as human beings because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word of God tells us the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so people might look you with a pretty face. They may even smile at you and shake your hand and give you a good embrace. But there might be a dagger that is there. That's the heart of man. So don't trust any man. But then there's also family government. It's also family government. How do you run your family? How do you rule the, the, the unit that God has given you control over? And then there is national government. Of course, local government. National government. But as one we many of us don't talk about. There's an international government. And they have a lot of power. The IMF, the World Bank, the IDB, and a number of those institutions and organizations, they come up with a lot of conventions, United Nations and so on, that no law of any kind, they supersede, they're called supranational institutions, they supersede local laws. And so if they say, guy, you're not going to do this, if they say you're going to do that, they're going to make sure that you do it. I want to challenge you as you go. Nobody knows, nobody knew a few months from now, a, a few months ago, that there was going to be a coronavirus making the wrongs. None of us knows what the world is going to be like a few months from now. But our confidence is in the Lord. That's where our confidence is. And so what are we called to do? I want you when you wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, you prophesy that Guyana, the best days of this country, are yet ahead. I want you to declare that the word of God will be fulfilled. The purposes of God, the promises of God, a revival will come to this land. I want you to practice what you preach. So prophesy. I want you to practice what you know. Not just in the head, but as you go forth, be the light, be the salt as you go forth. I usually tell people that you can have the best of politicians in any way. The people who would make the politician look good or bad are the public servants. You could have your best political dreams and agenda. Unless you have the public servants to fulfill your dream. You are not going to. People blame the government. But very often, the people in leadership don't even know what's going on in the departments and so on. And so it's the heart of man that's got to come forward. We've got to practice what we preach. Then we've got to pray. The Word of God tells us that very clearly. That pray first of all, pray for all men. Then pray for kings and for those in authority. Even if your political leader did not win, Pray for him still. Pray for the new one. Whoever holds office, pray for that person. We don't have to choose. We don't get that option to choose that I will pray for this person if I support them. Pray for those in authority. All three aspects or branches of government, the legislative, the executive, judiciary, pray for them because they are human beings who need the divine mind of God, the mandate of God, that wonderful counsel who can bring divine counsel to them. Our nation is coming up to a great, great, great time in our history. Not too long from now, our case with Venezuela will be called before the International Court of Justice. Let us not take it for granted. Let us not take it for granted. Let's be in prayer. We know that there are many people who are trying to infiltrate our land. Not just our continental neighbors, but people who have their own agenda. People who have their own agenda. There are many drug lords who are seeking to have control of God. Pray for men in uniform. Pray for, for police officers or army guys. Pray for them. Because as they confront this evil, there's great pushback as well too. So let's pray for them. 
I want to challenge you today as I close. I'm very conscious that some of you are thinking about the cup heel soup that you got there waiting for you. Some of you are thinking, what, Monday's a holiday, tomorrow's a holiday? Or you're going to throw back and you're going to be listening and looking at, uh, at, at the results coming and all of that. Let me release you to go. But I want to release you with a prayer today. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you that you sit upon the throne. There is none like you. Thank you that our faith is secure in you. Thank you, Lord God, that we can stand firm and strong. Lord, in your kingdom, we are neither black nor Indian nor Amerindian nor half, half. Lord God, whatever percentage, Lord God, we are all 100% Guyanese, regardless of our racial and ethnic composition and makeup, Lord God. Lord, the most important thing is that we are washed in your blood. That we belong to the household of faith. That we are connected one to another. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, we pray for our men in uniform even now. Whatever evils, Lord God, that are seeking, Lord God, to raise, Lord God, their heads, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. So we pray, God, that you will crush in the name of Jesus those diabolical forces right now. Lord, we pray, God, for peaceful elections tomorrow. Lord God, we come against skullduggery. We come against, Lord God, anything and everything, oh God, I will seek, Lord God, to infiltrate the systems, Lord. Expose, Lord God. Bring to naught, oh God. Frustrate, oh God. Nullify, oh God. Oh God, we pray that this dear, beautiful land of Guyana, that you have raised up, Lord God, to be your land, Lord God. Lord God, you have brought us as from all nations. You have made one, Lord God, us into one nation. Lord God, we pray that you will bless us. Give us peace instead of fear. Give us revelation, Lord God, instead, oh God, of blindness and darkness. Give us, O oh God, all is required, Lord God, to stand, Lord God, in your presence and to glorify you. Lord, we look forward to coming next week, Sunday, into your house. Lord God, with jubilation, Lord God, with celebration, not because of the political outcomes of the election, but because, Lord God, we have that sense of knowing that you, Lord God, you control all things. So we bless you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Make our prisons safe. Protect our prison warders, Lord God. Lord, make our streets safe. Make our fire, Lord God, department, Lord God, able to respond to whatever challenge it is, Lord God. Make our health system, Lord, our doctors and nurses. Lord, many of our brothers and sisters, many of our loved ones, many of our relatives, many of us, oh God, will have to be working tomorrow. Be with us, oh God. Lord, all the election officials, Lord God, in whatever shape and form they're involved in this process, give them wisdom, give them grace, give them vigilance, oh God. Oh God, we bless you today. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. In the mighty, precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, God loves you. And thank you for your grace. I know I've gone over your time. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for sharing some of that time with me. And I look forward for us coming to the house of the Lord next week to just rejoice in the presence of God. Amen? Go forth knowing that God is on the throne. God doesn't need a ballot box. God needs our hearts. That's all he wants. Let us law be written. Let us give him the vote of confidence. He has all things under control. Amen. God bless you. Greet somebody as you go. Remember to greet uh, Pastor Bro